Well, thank you for all promptly getting back in your seats. Um, our speaker today, Philip Goldberg, was the either the second or third speaker for the Inside Edge back in Beverly Hills in back in 1985. There's a little bit of argument between uh, different memories, let's put it that way, between Brooke and Diana. <laughs> but anyway, he spoke a long time ago. And um, he's been on an, quite an adventure. He's got a lot of publications. He's quite an, quite an expert and a student of the Hindu philosophy. And he has a book, which is he's on his book tour now called American Veda. And Diana has read most of it, and she thinks it's absolutely fantastic. So without further ado, Mr. Philip Goldberg. Thank you, sir. I, I've actually been here. I think this is the third time. So I'm a, and it's really nice to be back. Uh, it's sort of like speaking at, at 7.30 in the morning is kind of like uh, if you're a mountain climber, every few years you have to do a certain climb. You know, this is, <laughs> keeps you in shape. It's good to be back. This is a great institution. How many of you would say that um, your spiritual lives has been touched by India? That's what I thought. I'm uh, going to guess, no, I'm not going to guess, I'm going to predict that um, those of you who didn't raise your hand, if you, uh, at the end of the, my talk, at the end of my talk, or certainly if you read my book, will then realize that you've been touched by India more than you think. And those of you who did raise your hands probably will realize you've that the impact of India on your lives has been more than you realize. That, that was my experience in uh, researching American Veda. I discovered uh, that the, the extent to which India's heritage of spiritual teachings have uh, seeped into our uh, culture and the way we look at the world is, was even more than I thought when I first proposed the book, and I proposed the book for that reason. We have, over the course of a couple of hundred years, um, absorbed, adapted, and assimilated elements of the sort of vast and diverse uh, teachings that have come through uh, the centuries from India in ways that have uh, impacted institutions of American life in more than we realize, and especially the way we understand religion and spirituality. And it's not just the obvious ways with the millions of people who uh, have studied with gurus and have read the great Indian uh, texts and uh, take yoga classes and learn to meditate. The core teachings of the Vedanta philosophy and the, the methodologies of the yogic repertoire have sort of penetrated American soil through a variety of streams and tributaries and, and underground wells to the point where it sort of um, saturates culture to an extent that, that um, many people are affected by those teachings without even knowing it. Sounds insidious, but it's a really good thing that happened to us. It works like this. Somebody studies these teachings through directly or through books or whatever. Tells somebody else. That person tells somebody else. And people adapt practices and ideas. And it spreads like that like any good thing, like a new food or some new form of music or, or an art form. Ideas spread like that and practices spread like that. And along the way, some of the people who get influenced are prominent people. They're artists, they're psychologists, they're healthcare practitioners, they're medical researchers, they're scientists. 
their educators, etc. And those people influence many more than just their immediate friends and families. And that is the story that I, I tell in American Veda. And the, the threads and streams are so much more interesting than people realize, as I hope you'll get a sense of here. There's obviously no time to do it all justice. I just wrote a 350-page book, and it was very difficult to keep it under five or 600 or 1,000 even. There's just so much information and so many interesting characters and um, subplots along the way. Um, it's very frustrating to give a, a short talk, and it's very hard to keep it to a reasonable length because... You know, I just want to keep talking about this stuff. But I want to get make it, make sure we have plenty of time to open it up to you guys. I am. I want, this will be the first, the only commercial. I am teaching longer workshops based on the book, where there'll be an opportunity to go deeper and to actually sample some of the practices that have come here from India. I'm doing one at uh, Unity of Tustin in February, and another at Loyola Marymount in January. So you, if that's of interest to you, see me afterward. So I'm going to focus on some of the key moments in the story and illustrate some of those uh, streams and tributaries that I mentioned, uh, leaving out, of course, a lot. I'm going to skip over the uh, centuries of contact between ancient Greece and India and uh, Europe as it was evolving through the age of uh, exploration and trade and the first uh, translations of in Sanskrit texts that came from England and, and Germany. And I'm going to start in New England a couple of hundred years ago. I hope this works. Yes, with him. Those first books the first translations and commentaries about India came and arrived in New England at the time Emerson was a boy. How many of you have read Emerson? Anybody who reads Emerson, and this was one of the great discoveries, I have to say, anybody who reads Emerson, whether it's for a high school assignment or college or just your own edification, is getting a dose of Indian philosophy, whether you realize it or not, because those books that came in from India or via Europe um, had a huge impact on the evolution of Emerson's thinking and his philosophy. And his impact on America is so profound and so uh, in, deep that you know, he's called our founding philosopher, our founding thinker, the Plato of America. His influence on our collective worldview and our literature is extraordinary. So that I say in the book, if he was the only person in America who ever read a, a, a text from India, the influence of India would still be very great. And of course, his first impact was on Thoreau. How many of you have read Walden at some point in your life? Right? When you read Walden, you read about the Bhagavad Gita because he had it with him at the pond every day. He borrowed it from Emerson's library and it had a very big effect on him and he extols the virtues of Indian thinking when you read, anybody who reads Thoreau, whether it's some young kid in his backpack or you know, an older person uh, revisiting it, you are reading probably the first person, certainly the first public person, to call himself a yogi. He uses that term in the book. Now, I just want to give you a quick illustration of one of the many ways that the India-America, India-America influence reverberates back and forth across the globe. Thoreau was influenced very deeply by the Bhagavad Gita. 
Gandhi was influenced by Thoreau. Martin Luther King was influenced by Gandhi. This is one of the many ways that this relationship uh, has, has uh, fed upon itself. Those two guys had an effect on Whitman, our sort of founding poet, our bard. He was strongly influenced by India, and his work, his persona, and, and what he did with poetry is still with us. He set the template for American poetry. Everybody from Emily Dickinson to Bob Dylan was affected by, the, by what Walt Whitman created. So these are some of the ways that little tastes of India end up being translated into American idioms and then idia, idioms, and, and then filter into the culture. Some of the people in New England who are immediately affected by Emerson especially and then directly by Indian texts were the sort of founders of what, we, what came to be called the New Thought Movement. Madame Blavatsky, who started Theosophy, Mary Baker Eddy, who started Christian Science, and then a little later, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore and Ernest Holmes, the founders, respectively, as you know, of Unity Church and Religious Science. This was one of the great discoveries, how much those sort of... Uh, of progenitors of new thought were affected directly by India. You can see in their own writings, especially early on. If you go to a unity church, if you go to a church of religious science or science of mind, if you go to Agape or any of the places down here, you are getting a taste of India when you go and hear a sermon, whether the speaker mentions India directly or not because <clears throat> it is in the sort of founding DNA of, of new thought. And if you look closely, you can see it, Ernest Holmes especially, because he came along later at a time when access to Indian teachers and uh, books were much easier than it was early on. He actually was a friend of uh, Yogananda's. Then there was this big turning point. One of, I'm going to just mention a few of the big turning points. This is a poster of Swami Vivekananda at the 1893 World's Parliament of Religions in Chicago. This was a huge turning point. He's the sort of he's the Jackie Robinson of the story. He was the first. He was the first Indian teacher to have an, to come here and have an impact on America a really a giant figure in, in, the, in the book. He spent about three years here on uh, two separate visits and established the first teaching institutions to bring the teachings of Indian philosophy or Vedanta to uh, in, in westernized form. So he created the Vedanta Society, where, which ended up having uh, centers in most of the major cities and uh, uh, generations of swamis sent from headquarters in India after Vivekananda died in 1902, uh, swamis came and, uh, to run the centers, and their influence has been extraordinary. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of these threads. Oh, what happened? I went back. But I want to pause for a second because this is a good moment to just sort of say, what is it that actually came here, right? What Swami Vivekananda, in the, before he was a Swami, in the, in the 19th century in Bengal, was a young man, and there was a, a, a lot of ferment at the time. And there was something called the Hindu Renaissance, an attempt by modern Indian thinkers who are influenced by the West and by science, to sort of modernize the Hindu tradition and make it uh, amenable 
to the modern age and to Western, uh, to science, and sort of adapt that. And what Vivekananda did was a sort of it set the template for all the successful gurus who have come here over the last couple of hundred years, because he he introduced a way to be spiritual that was so practical and so rational that it could be understood as a science of consciousness, not necessarily as a religion. They removed a lot of the Indian cultural artifacts of, that we associate with Hinduism because they were not necessary and taught a philosophy and a series of methodologies that anybody could adapt into their way of life. And in so doing, these teachers offered something that was missing from mainstream religion for the most part, which was a w practical ways to achieve personal transformation and transcendence inwardly, a direct connection to the divine built on a philosophy that did not require that you convert to anything or that you uh, buy into any particular set of dogmas or, or an interpretation of history. And they were respectful of all the traditions. Every teacher from India who came here revered the person of Jesus as a, as a great master. And all of these things proved to be enormously successful, especially with well-educated, uh, open-minded uh, Westerners, whether they were uh, religious in orientation or secular in orientation. It was uh, a, a wonderful to think sort of as, as a, in commercial terms, it was a really good product for this market. And some of those people who were influenced by these teachings, some of the Americans, became disseminators of the teachings themselves, what I call in the book Vedic transmitters. For example, this is Swami Prabhavananda who ran the uh, Vedanta Society in Los Angeles with Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood back in the 1940s. Huxley, Isherwood, and Gerald Hurd, who's not pictured, were uh, expatriate Brits who lived in America and uh, great literary superstars and philosophers who were mentored in Vedanta by Prabhavananda and produced voluminous writings that I won't even begin to list, including Huxley's classic, The Perennial Philosophy, that were among the very first uh, books about uh, Indian philosophy that many of us read in the 1960s. I still have my copies, and I know they, I have had them that long because the price is 95 cents. <laughs> At the same time, in St. Louis, the person who ran the Vedanta Society was Swami Satka Prashananda, and he uh, he was mentoring a young religious scholar named Houston Smith back in the 50s. And, of course, Houston Smith went on to become the most important scholar of religion of uh, our time and wrote a, a classic textbook on comparative religion that is still being used, still sold by the thousands, sold over five million copies altogether and change the way we understand religion and the way comparative religion is looked at because of his mentorship with, with the Swami. And I got that straight from Houston's mouth when I interviewed him. Um, these are some of the ways that these threads come in. In New York, at the same time, Swami Nikilananda was uh, teaching Joseph Campbell. How many of you have read or seen Joseph Campbell on television? There he is being interviewed on the famous PBS series by Bill Moyers. Millions and millions of people were getting lessons in Indian philosophy through Houston Smith, through Joseph Campbell in, in these ways. Also hanging out with Swami Nikolananda at that time was J.D. Salinger. <laughs> 
How many of you have read any of Salinger after Catcher in the Rye? <laughs> after Catcher in the Rye. Okay. I highly recommend it. Starting with Franny and Zooey, well, actually starting with some of the short stories, and then Franny and Zooey and subsequent works, it's, you're getting sort of Eastern philosophy 101 in contemporary fictional form. And it, it's really extraordinary. I had to write an essay about, for a book once about the book that most influenced my life, and I chose Franny and Zooey. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, we won't go into all that. <laughs> but there were reasons for it. Then came a very, uh, another key moment, and I'm gonna, uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, but you get a sense, don't you, for how these teachings sort of spread in. There are zillions of fans of J.D. Salinger. They don't know they're reading Indian philosophy necessarily. Even though he mentions things explicitly, it, it's there, it permeates his work. Same with Joseph Campbell and his perspective. Same with Houston Smith. Then in 1920 was another turning point when the second most important uh, guru, uh, not second in rank, but in, in time, came. When I interviewed, I interviewed over 300 people for American Veda, and I asked them how they first got involved with Indian teachings. Many of them would mention a book. Usually somebody gave me a copy of such and such. What book do you think is the most often mentioned? Very good. So this was another key moment. Yogananda came in 1920. He was the first major guru to settle here. He made his, headqu oh, made his headquarters L.A. and uh, stay there and um, essentially created a lineage that is still very well functioning in, in America. His, his centers, that, uh, his self-realization fellowship and, and other fringe groups, his influence remains. He died in 1952, but his influence is still extraordinary, and largely because of that book. That was a seminal book for a lot, a lot of people. And, you know, it has sold, I think they told me, over 5 million copies over the years. It still sells a lot. But I can tell you, in the 60s, this was one of the most borrowed books. This went from crash pad to crash pad until the orange cover was all, all torn up. And <laughs> Then there are other teachers in the 40s and 50s, certain, uh, even earlier, certain teachers from India became known in America who never even came here. One of them was Ramana Maharshi. I discovered a 1949 Life magazine, 12-page oh, spread on Ramana Maharshi with wonderful photographs. And it turned out that some of the older people I interviewed were impacted by that article. And then, you know, one of them was Lilius Folan, who became one of the most famous yoga teachers in America. She was a 13-year-old girl, saw that article, and it had a big impact on her life. Paul Brunton's books and other things. I'm just showing him because I love the pictures, but also because he's an example of a teacher. He died in 1950. Very few people at the time heard of him, but now... A lot of people know it. His picture is probably on more altars in America than, they, you know, than any other teacher because for a variety of ways you can read about in the book. He's, and one of the ways was he served as the, he was the, the model for Somerset Mom's guru figure in The Razor's Edge, which was a huge bestseller and made into a movie twice. It was a book you know, that I read about an American spiritual seeker who goes to India and changes his life. Another influential, another way that uh, the arts have become, have been a channel for Indian teachings. Then another great uh, teacher who never came here, who also died in 1950. How many of you have ever been to Esalen? Okay. Esalen was started by these guys. Dick Price and Michael Murphy. 
Michael Murphy's story, which I tell in the book, is, is really a great example of what I'm talking about. As a sophomore at Stanford, he stumbled into a, a class in comparative religion, heard about Indian philosophy, changed his major, got totally on fire with the whole thing, and upon graduation went to India and spent over a year at the ashram of Sri Aurobindo, who was no longer there, but the ashram still existed. Michael came home all on fire with the, uh, with the vision of creating a place where the best of the East and the best of the West could come together to develop human potential. That was when we first started to hear the term human potential. And, and how it came about, uh, there's a lot of fun in, in the story of how Esalen and the land and everything uh, came to be. But it was an Aurobindian vision and a, a vision from straight out of Indian philosophy that influenced Michael and Dick Price to start Esalen, which in turn, of course, has affected hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people because it's not just a place to go into hot tubs naked. It's a place where deep teachings about ourselves and, and life have been taught and conveyed to many, many thousands of people. It was also the place where the, the discipline of psychology started to change through people like Abraham Maslow, who's here at the Esalen Dining Room. He and other pioneering psychologists, all of whom were affected by India in one way or another, started humanistic psychology, the whole theories of self-actualization, then transpersonal psychology, and so on and so forth. Also, out of Aurobindo came a couple of teaching institutions in the Bay Area, such as the American Academy of Asian Studies, which was started in the early 50s by Michael Murphy's uh, one of the, the head of the faculty was Michael Murphy's professor at Stanford, who turned him on to Eastern philosophy. The guy on the right is Alan Watts, the young Alan Watts, who of course went on to be, he was recruited to teach there and became of course one of the great uh, interpreters and proponents of, of Eastern teachings in America. And, and that, that um, influence is still there. Uh, the Indian guy next to Alan Watts started something called the Cultural Integration Fellowship, and I'm speaking there in March. It still exists. It's still a force for the East-West sort of integration. Then, and, and some of the people who would come there to hear those people speak were the hippies, uh, the beatniks of, of San Francisco, uh, like Alan and, and some of the others, who, of course, the, in turn became purveyors of Eastern teachings it, it, through their poetry and, in Allen Ginsberg's case, uh, chanting in the streets and chanting on William Buckley's television show. And you know, If you want to see something really cool, YouTube, Google Allen Ginsberg on William Buckley's firing line. There's a moment when he stops and takes out a harmonium and does a Krishna chant. And just to watch Buckley's face... <laughs> Prices, absolutely pricing. <laughs> then came the big game-changing moment about which we can talk forever, the 60s. Oh, yeah. Oh, were some of you there? Yeah. Oh, yes? Now, I want to, I want to, are we ready? I, I want you to listen. This is a contest. The, the person who first or I should say, the first person to yell out the answer to this next question gets a free book. American Veda, not just any book. Um, <laughs> the question is, we're going to play a little music. The question is, why is that relevant to this subject? Ready? No, oh, please work. <laughs> Why? I, I can't hear. I need an arbiter. <laughs> <laughs> 
What about it? What? All right. Why is it relevant? Because they went back to they went back to study in India and where John Lennon was specifically very influenced and brought back uh, Ravi Shankar, I believe. Close. Who did it? What did you? I heard you say something, Linda. I said that the sitar for the first time. Yeah, that's it. That's the key. Linda wins, and and she's not just because she's an old friend of mine. <laughs> she was the one to say it was the first time. This was the first time most of us heard a sitar. Unless you were a jazz fan and you listened to some of the jazz musicians that Ravi Shankar uh, influenced. This was the first time a sitar was used in a Beatles record or any rock and roll record. And it was a game changer because, not just because it changed music, because it made Ravi Shankar this you know, virtuoso, oh God, only have, oh my God, we have so much more to talk just about. This led, it was because George discovered the sitar on the set of Help and went to India and studied with Ravi Shankar. And Ravi Shankar said, you have to understand the philosophy that underlies all this. And George started reading. And he became the, the, most, uh, the strongest seeker of the Beatles. And that led, eventually, to this, which we mentioned earlier. If you were around in 1968, whoops, you saw one variation of this picture or another plastered all over every magazine, every newspaper. You saw Maharishi Mahesh Yogi on Johnny Carson on the Today Show. This was the most extraordinary blast of Indian philosophy in history. For a few months' time, there were, it was all over the place. If there was an Oprah, you know, there would have been an Oprah. This was the beginning. This was when people heard the word mantra for the first time and the word guru and the word karma. This is what led to the legitimization of meditation because with all the young people like me who are running out and, and learning to meditate and changing their lives, scientists said, what's going on here? They started doing studies. I was actually a subject in Herbert Benson's first study of meditation on, on blood pressure, 1969 or 70. And that now there's thousands of studies. And now your doctor will tell you to meditate for stress release, whereas at the time it was a hippie phenomenon. It moved quickly into the mainstream so that seven or eight years later, the same Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was on Merv Griffin's show with Clint Eastwood and Mary Tyler Moore talking about meditation, not the Beatles. And so this is 1975. Every, this was a game changer. As a result of this, Indian teachings were so, had become so mainstream and so legitimate that we then had a parade of gurus. And I'm just going to run through some of them quickly. And I'm, I apologize if I left your guru out. Swami Satchidananda, who spoke at Woodstock and numbered many, many disciples, uh, including uh, Dean Ornish, who based his whole program, uh, his health, heart, you know, Dr. Dean Ornish, his whole heart reduction, heart disease uh, intervention on Satchidananda's yoga teachings. And, of, of course, the, the, the Hare Krishnas were everywhere. And Krishnamurti, here as a young man, then as an old man, uh, who had been around for decades, suddenly uh, had many, many more people coming to see him. Even though he was denouncing all the gurus, everybody came to see him because they saw him as a guru, despite his own uh, uh, denunciations. Uh, and then Swami Muktananda with Guru Mai, his successor, and Swami Rama, there pictured on the left, uh, being studied at the Menninger Clinic. Sri Chinmoy, who, uh, some of whose disciples uh, were famous musicians like Carlos Santana. Guru Maharaji, who was then 13 years old, remember him? The 13-year-old perfect master, he was called. He is still teaching under his real name, Pram Rawat. He's a nice 50-something-year-old man with a family living in Malibu and uh, giving up his 
gave up his messiahship. Uh, Rajneesh, Osho, who later became Osho, the, who was rather the most notorious, and the, the, the teachers who were most responsible for the physical yoga that we now think of as yoga, Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, all these people came. They all brought out one, a different aspect of Indian teachings and yogic practices. They all appealed to different people. Of course, there was a lot of mixing and matching. Yes, yes, 10 minutes. And then, of course, we have the advent of Westerners, Americans, becoming teachers in their own right, the prototype being Ram Dass, who, of course, was uh, previously Richard Alpert, the Sundance kid to Timothy Leary's Butch Cassidy in the psychedelic time, and then you know, became Ram Dass, and the, the first uh, American to attract large numbers of people. I interviewed him for the book, and I asked him what I, he thought his effect on the culture was, and he said, I was like an uncle to the counterculture. And he was. He was like your hip uncle who knew stuff and, and was living it as a real-life American, not as an Indian swami or guru. Um, then, of course, other Americans became gurus. Other Americans became teachers influenced by Indian philosophy and famous. And then many... Western religious figures became influenced by these teachings and in turn changed the way Christians and Jews understand religion and understand spiritual practice, spirituality. Thomas Keating developed centering prayer. You all know centering prayer. Perhaps some of you practice it. It was derived specifically from the instructive instruction manual for transcendental meditation be, and adapt it to a Christian format. That to me, that's one of the great symbols of how India has affected even Western religion. Contemplative Christianity, Jewish mysticism are huge now. If you Google Christian meditation or Jewish meditation, you will see thousands of entries all of it stimulated back in the 60s and 70s because young people were learning Eastern practices. And the leaders of the Jewish and Christian tradition said, we must have something like that. And they opened the vaults to the hidden mystical teachings that had not been available. So one of the effects of India has been to democratize practical sort of mysticism. I'm now going to uh, curtail this and just sort of fast forward to some of the newer gurus and the, some of the yoga celebrities and new phenomena like uh, Sanskrit chanting, which is drawing thousands of people to yoga studios, and leave it on that so you have a subliminal uh, suggestion to buy the book. And uh, so tomorrow, when you're giving thanks for things, Give a little nod to India, because it has affected you in a positive way more than you may realize. India, if I had to sum it up, gave people who are not religious in the traditional ways a way to be spiritual, a way to be practically spiritual. It gave us all a higher vision of what we are and what we can become than was then known by psychologists. And as a friend of mine put it, it turned us from original sin to original bliss by changing our understanding of the nature of what we are. So uh, I don't know if you can get tandoori turkey, but <laughs> maybe a little mango chutney with your cranberry sauce. Thanks. I want to open it up now. We have some time for, for Q&A. No, you. You. <laughs> well, there's a name that I'm curious about. <clears throat> uh, back in the late 60s, it was Alexander Everett and uh, Mind Dynamics, and that gave birth to Werner Earhart and John Hanley, and all of those self-help did Was that someplace connected? There are a million things having to do with the mind and, and all that that probably were affected by India, but... There was just so much I could research. I did look into Werner Earhart, and the evidence seems to be that he was kind of influenced by Zen. Uh, 
later, after Est was a huge phenomenon, got interested. He was the person who brought Swami Muktananda here for the first time. And so um, he later became, but it didn't look like it had anything to do with the uh, origins of Est. So I, I left it out. Yes. I, I oh. got you here. <clears throat> uh, just a statement and then a, and then a question. Uh, I think the people up there that were most influential on me were uh, like Oral Bindo, was like really a great writer. And, uh, and Rajneesh was also a, a really Rajneesh great Rajneesh was a really good, his books, are, I mean, whatever you think of him as a person, his books are pretty extraordinary. Yeah. And Aurobindo, if you can get through them, has left a legacy of, of, of philosophical writings that's unsurpassed. And one of the great things about him as a modern man educated in England was he understood Darwin. All these, most of yeah. these gurus were, were educated in West, and he applied theory of evolution to spiritual evolution in ways that are still people are studying and writing papers about and so forth. What about the role of Los Angeles? It seems like yeah, you know, I want to give, um, I'm, I'm teaching this uh, workshop at Loyola Marymount, and we're talking about also doing a one, a one day sort of tour of Vedic Los Angeles. Because it became, it was real. When Yogananda came, he called L.A. the Benares of, of America and, and decided to you know, establish his headquarters there and, of course, had the best real estate karma of any guru who ever came here, if you've seen his, lo his locations. Um, and, and so they were here. The Vedanta Society's main temple was here. The uh, TM in the, in the heyday was... Uh, their offices were here, the Hare Krishnas, were, they were all here and still are to a large extent. Yeah? A number of my friends are involved with Kabbalah. I didn't hear you mention that. Kabbalah. Uh huh. Yeah. Jewish, well, the, the Jewish mysticism. What, Kabbalah was a, a form of Jewish mysticism that was so esoteric, it was only for men, certain men over 40, buried esoteric teachings. It is now widely available and democratized largely because some of the proponents of Kabbalah as young men, because they're usually men, uh, were, were people who went to India and studied in ashrams and new gurus and then looked into their own tradition and decided to revive it and bring it out for the modern, modern age. Got it. Yes, purple. Uh, no, here. Oh. <laughs> I have a question and a comment. What were the books in front of the Beatles? That was one question. What were what? The books. Each one had a book. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd have to go back okay. and look. That was just a curiosity question. And then uh, some of us who have read about the American Indians, it's very interesting that with the uh, sophisticated DNA studies now, they have found that the DNA markers of the Tibetans and the American Indians are the same. So. I just thought that was interesting All that right. they carried that with them. I'll have to look into that. I'm really curious about the, um, when, when you look at the perennial philosophy, and then you get up to Wilbur, and it seems to me like we're moving from a spiritually or religious-based um, way of looking at life to a study of consciousness. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that that, that evolution into yeah. the study of consciousness itself. We could that's, that boy. That's not a simple uh, thing to do, but uh, but in a sense, the book talks about that a lot because, and I agree with you. And one of the one of the things that has stimulated our uh, evol evolution of our understanding of consciousness and our understanding of what spirituality is and what spiritual experience is was access to the teachings and practices of India and also of Buddhism, which I don't cover in the book. Because there, it has been a science of consciousness for centuries. But because we think of those as religious traditions, it, it took certain people with, with key insights and certain of the uh, gurus who came here to say, you can look at this as a science of consciousness. You don't have to look at it in religious terms, which is what got psychologists interested in it. And so the whole understanding of human development 
shifted, as I put it in the book. There was a, a, a ceiling on human development, and then access to these teachings and uh, uh, experiences of higher states of consciousness sort of built more stories onto our understanding of human development. And that's an ongoing project. Actually, Esalen's one of the places where there's an important study of consciousness going on. And I, and I, I think that that's in the, the, the direction we're going. I, I just wrote, I, I blog on the Huffington Post. The, the blog that's coming up any day now, so I just sent it in, is, is something, I think I called it, um, let's hear it for sane spirituality. And, and I think one of the effects of the exposure to Indian and Eastern teachings in general has been to give us a way to be spiritual in a sensible, rational, pragmatic way so that the alternatives, despite what you hear on television, aren't just traditional fundamentalist kind of religion and atheism. And I think if you look at all the trends, in, in chapter one I, I give evidence for how India has affected our understanding of religion and spirituality, and I think it's reflected in the religious surveys. So the number of people who call themselves spiritual but not religious, there's a steady rise over time of that category, and it, and it doesn't mean they're, 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 not, they're serious, for the most part, about their spiritual lives, but not conventionally religious. And young people in their 20s and 30s, the biggest percentage of all. So that's the direction it's going. Sorry to take up all this time, but thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank My you, pleasure. Phil.